Drama in DC. Will things ever settle down in the Trump White House? Craig Gilbert gives us an update. Is Governor Scott Walker getting a win with Foxconn? It seems to be moving forward at the Capitol. 50 years ago, a child was featured in a photograph that became a symbol for the civil rights movement in Milwaukee. James Causey talks about his recent interview with her. All that, plus winners and losers and viewer questions, today on JS on Politics. Welcome to JS on Politics. I'm your host, Mary Spakuza. I spoke earlier with DC Bureau Chief Craig Gilbert about the latest turmoil in President Trump's administration. Here's what he had to say. I'm joined now by Craig Gilbert, our Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief. Um, Craig, what are the latest poll numbers showing us about how voters are responding to President Trump, uh, you know, months into his presidency in the wake of some um, pretty serious turmoil and controversy? Well, you know, as crazy as it sounds, you know, seven or eight months into a presidency, uh, you do get kind of a sense of Trump fatigue in some of these polls. There was a new national poll just out by Quinnipiac, which showed voters reacting overwhelmingly negatively to the president's handling of Charlottesville. Um, this sort of sense that, uh, the, that this is the, a divisive presidency, not a unifying presidency. Obviously, his approval ratings aren't very good. They're down in the mid-30s nationally. And in Wisconsin, there was a poll by NBC Marist released over the weekend which just contained all sorts of awful numbers for the president. Um, among other things, you know, his his standing with women and with college graduates is just as bad as it was before. It's almost catastrophic now. I mean, his, you know, positive numbers in the 20s uh, with those groups, um, some signs of trouble in his own base. I mean, he's underwater with, with blue collar white voters, which we think of as his demographic base. Um, and a lot of Republicans expressing concern. I mean, you know, 25 percent, 30 percent of Republicans with negative views in Wisconsin, embarrassed by the president, thinking that the, the U.S. is now weaker on the world stage as a result of this presidency. A lot of them thinking of him as dividing their own party, not unifying it. So a lot of trouble. Um, I would wrap it all up by just saying that, um, you know, unfortunately for the president, he's just as unpopular today as he was on election day, which is actually kind of worse than it sounds because he got elected amid some really high negatives in Wisconsin and nationally. Um, he had every opportunity in the world to kind of improve on those numbers as he became president because some of the people that voted for him uh, frankly didn't like him but were invested in his presidency by voting for him. That really hasn't happened. I mean, he, he showed some surge uh, after he took office and now he's kind of back to where he was. So pretty grim numbers overall for a first year presidency. And how is House Speaker Paul Ryan from Janesville handling all of this? Well, it's really interesting. We saw Paul Ryan with a big kind of national town hall meeting on CNN. You've got the contrast with Mitch McConnell. Um, it's kind of the reverse of was it what it was in the campaign year when Paul Ryan was the one who was kind of criticizing Trump openly and Trump was feuding with Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell was kind of the low profile guy, Mitch McConnell, the Senate leader. And now it's kind of the reverse. There's this very um, kind of bad feud going on right now between Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, and President Trump. And Paul Ryan keeps trying to sort of make the relationship work. Um, he was he offered some criticism at his town hall of President Trump's handling of Charlottesville for the first time. He actually criticized the president directly, but it was not you know it was pretty muted criticism. And he is. He is try he's been trying to avoid at all costs becoming a kind of a foil and the kind of critic of Trump within his own party that he was during the campaign. I think he's doing that because he thinks it's bad for the Republican agenda and it's kind of divisive for the party, but it has taken a real toll on his own popular standing nationally, and I think to some degree in Wisconsin, because a lot of people outside the Republican base who kind of like Paul Ryan more than the average Republican um, now see him um, as being a Trump enabler, and they're a lot more negative about him now. It does seem like he's kind of in a no-win situation there. Thanks, Craig. Talk to you soon. All right. Next time. Thanks. I'm joined now by Capitol reporter Jason Stein. Jason, what's the latest with our belated budget plan in Madison? Right. 
So, uh, so when last we heard of the state budget, it had been held up since June 15th, so more than two months, uh, by disagreements among Republicans over a couple key areas, especially uh, how much money to borrow and how much money to raise from taxes for road building in Wisconsin. And now we are finally seeing some movement on that. The Joint Finance Committee is meeting uh, right now just starting up to do some minor things with regard to the state budget. And then on Monday, they're gonna take up some major issues around uh, funding for education in the state. And, and so it seems like, although you know we still haven't gotten a, a, a deal uh, for all the things that are outstanding, at least there seems to be some progress on the budget in the last few days. There's been a lot of debate about Foxconn and what the jobs requirements will be in that bill. Are there any updates on that? Yes, earlier this week, uh, we reported on a budget committee hearing that happened uh, down in Sturdivant and some state officials talked there. So basically without getting into the you know really gritty details of it, there are different pots of money that Foxconn could get cash payments from state of Wisconsin taxpayers to, to build this plant and, and hire thousands of workers there. And basically, some of those payments dealing with the plant itself wouldn't come with a minimum jobs requirement under the, the current bill that is before lawmakers. And so there's been, you know, earlier this week, you had state officials hinting that they might, in the contract with Foxconn, put a minimum jobs number on the company for, for all the money that they get from state taxpayers in, in cash. And you know that, that has satisfied some Republican lawmakers, other Democratic lawmakers have said, no, we don't wanna just have that, that verbal commitment from you guys. You know, we wanna see the contract or have it written into the legislation. You know, we wanna actually see the language before we, before we vote yes. Thanks, Stein. Thank you. I spoke earlier with James Causey about his new story um, about a woman that was featured in a famous photo 50 years ago with Father Grappi. Here's what he had to say. I'm joined now by James Causey, who's been doing uh, wonderful coverage for us and actually tracked down a woman that was in a famous photo from 50 years ago that really came to symbolize the civil rights movement here in Milwaukee. Um, James. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on. How did you find her? Well, um, that was the hardest part. She sort of disappeared from Milwaukee, and, and no one that I talked to from the movement actually knew how to get in contact with her. Uh, then I uh, talked to uh, Father Grappi's widow, and she said, you know what? She sent me an email probably like three or four years ago, and um, I, I don't know if it's still active or not, but give it a try. And I did. and. Um, I sent her an email saying, you know, I'm James Causey with the Journal Sentinel, I'd like to talk to you, and she got back to me. And so we arranged to go out to Virginia, where she lives, and uh, do the story. And what does she remember most about that day? That day, the iconic photo, um, is really, she remembers it very vividly. Um, her mother had her practice parts of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., I Have a Dream speech. And um, she comes from a large family, a family of 12. And her mother was very active in the movement and very active in uh, open housing marches. So uh, she wanted her daughter, uh, Lucia Rogers, to participate in, in this program that Father Grappi had. And so she encouraged her to get up on the stage next to him and delivered a speech after he gave a little press conference. So she's standing up there nervous because she never spoke to so many people or delivered a speech in front of a crowd of over 100 plus. And so she was nervous, shaking, and Father Grappi noticed this and he reached down and took her by the hand. And she said, you know what, I think, you know, oh, with all the stuff going on, I think he needed that comfort as, just as much as I did. Fortunately, uh, after the press conference, he walked off the stage and left her there. And she never got a chance to deliver her I Have a Dream speech because they went on a march right after that. And what is she up to now? Well, um, this is 50 years later. I mean, she was 11 at the time that this took place, um, when she was when that famous iconic photo uh, took place. So she works up on a hill. Uh, she works in the department, U.S. Department of Taxation. 
um, and she's like a sec secretary, and she's been working up on a hill for like almost 30 years, and uh, she's she's a wonderful woman, very uh, personable. Never got married, never had children, but uh, she's very much involved in, in in what's going on back here in in her hometown of Milwaukee, and uh, taking care of her nieces and nephews when she can. What did she have to say about Milwaukee and how she views the city? Well, she gets back here sporadically. She, um, the last time she was here was just this past July. Fortunately, her brother, uh, Sebastian, got sick and she came to see him. He died uh, a little bit after she left. But while she was here, she got an opportunity, it was her first time here in like 10 years, she got an opportunity to see how much downtown was booming with the new arena and all the new development with NML and all that growth that's taking place down there. And she said that same growth and that same energy isn't taking place in the central city, and she wonders why. Because some of the same things that she left 30 years ago, they're, they're still the same, and she doesn't understand why that is. I think that's something that we've been talking about quite a bit and oh, yeah. probably will be talking about for, for months to come. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined now by reporter Bill Glauber and columnist Dan Bice for Winners and Losers. Um, Bill, who is your winner this week? Corey Mason. He's in the assembly. He's running for mayor of Racine. He broke with most Democrats and supported the Foxconn legislation. Uh, also, Todd Onstadt and Peter Barco also broke. You know, uh, it, the Democrats obviously have to move into something more than obstruction. Uh, especially since they can't obstruct anything in Madison. And uh, Mason took a local uh, vision, a, a local look at Foxconn, said it would uh, help manufacturing, help with jobs in the area. So he went for it and uh, probably puts him in the driver's seat, although that's where he was in the race for Racine mayor. But he came across as an adult. And uh, I think that uh, Democrats in the Senate, some of them should be looking at what uh, Mason did. Okay. So were you surprised there were only three who voted for the Foxconn deal? Uh, well, the party is in disarray, so nothing surprises me with the Democrats. And, you know, to sort of, they can, you know, they needed to have probably more people being allowed to come over and vote for Foxconn. There's also, you know, the taxpayer issue, is this too much money? But, you know, Democrats are basically uh, thumbing their nose at what could be job creation. I realize there's risk not coming out in support of Foxconn, but it seems to me that, uh, you know, with so many jobs that uh, could be created by this, I think you'd probably want to be on that train. Jobs that could be in his district of Racine, of course. Kenosha area. Yes. Well, the so three that people who voted for it were in that region. No <laughs> one, none of the other Democrats voted for it. No one from Milwaukee voted for it. Yeah, and I just think that, that that is a sign of a party that doesn't have its stuff together. Um, you know, this is a big jobs, uh, a potential big job creator, and uh, you don't want to really get in the way of that. I realize we're talking up to $3 billion in incentives. That's unheard of, unprecedented. So I can understand reluctance, but uh, just snapping at it like a poodle uh, that's angry uh, probably isn't getting them anywhere. An angry poodle. Um, okay, what about your loser? Well, that one's pretty easy. Donald Trump, he, uh, he zigged and zagged. His uh, speech in Arizona was uh, as unpresidential a speech as that you will ever see. Uh, his base likes it, but that base could be growing smaller. He got bad poll numbers in some battleground states, including Wisconsin. Uh, he's now attacking, as of earlier t Thursday, he's attacking uh, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan uh, in Washington. Uh, you need allies, especially when you're under investigation, which he apparently is. You, the, weird, the weird situation with Mitch McConnell is Mitch McConnell's wife is in the cabinet, and right. so it makes it a little more difficult. And they had yeah. a, a, there were a lot of stories over the weekend saying that the president and Mitch McConnell had a phone conversation that ended up in shouting between the two of them and, uh, and hanging up, and that they've uh, not talked since then, so yeah, different. And, and they're also threatening on the debt ceiling. I mean, if the United States defaults even for a couple of hours, it could potentially be a, a pretty big economic hit. Uh, it just it just seems unstable. He seems unstable right now, unfit. That's how he appears. I'm not saying that's how he is. That's how he appears, and that's really not how you want to appear as the, president. The interesting thing was Vice President Pence 
had been selling the speech as a policy speech, that Tuesday night's talk would be uh, focused on policy and so forth. Did, any, did he tell the president that? He didn't <laughs> uh, well, you know, he, he, the president had largely abandoned it. It might have been on policy. <laughs> we don't know. Well, it was there on the teleprompter. He just didn't read what was on the teleprompter. Um, which, you know, sometimes when he sticks to the script, people tend to praise him and say he's being presidential. It's when he does what he did on Tuesday night, when he goes off script, that, um, you know, that he... That, that his base loves it, and everybody else is wondering what's going on. And there were people who were streaming out of that speech. Was, uh, apparently, his supporters. I mean, it was. He talked it, for quite a while. He was getting into Castro territory on time. I realize Castro used to go four hours, but you know, to hold people there for an hour and fifteen minutes for a speech. Okay, it was Clinton esque, but even longer than. Well, Bill yeah, he Clinton. just likes the response, though. Yeah, he does. He and does. and you and you know, musicians like that. Lots of people like feeding off of the energy and stuff, but you have to realize, you know, that if you take it too far, that you start to lose that. So, speaking of lose that. Speaking of, tu well, speaking of Tuesday night, I should say, who is your winner? Because my, my winner is, is uh, Sheriff Joe, who apparently wasn't supposed to be in the speech, <laughs> but, um, but the president indicated, hinted very strongly that he's going to pardon him, which mm -hmm. was a big turn change of direction, because earlier in the day, his spokeswoman had said that he probably was not going to pardon him. And uh, Sheriff Joe Apario had said that he had not spoken directly with the president about it. But, you know, what, what did he say? That he'll be in a, uh, that he thinks things will turn out well for him or whatever. So, well, yeah, um, right. so I think things are looking good for Sheriff Joe. Okay. What about your loser? Um, my loser is uh, more local. It's the West Dallas taxpayers. They had voted down a bond referendum um, just recently because there was, uh, the school district had really screwed up, overspent its budget, and they needed more money. The, the taxpayers voted down the bond issue, so they went to the state and asked if they could borrow uh, 15, 17 million dollars to help shore up their budget. The state said sure, so now the taxpayers have to pay for that. So they end up with a tax increase, even though they voted one down. Got it. Um, all right. Well, we're ready for viewer questions. Um, Matthew on Twitter asked, um, "Give me three ideas of how many of how any Democrat will beat Scott Walker." Uh, I guess that's open for either of you guys. We can do it collectively. Yeah, there you go. Uh, um, um, well, you want to start? I think, well, I think it depends a lot on what's happening in the economy. If the economy here tanks, that would be one thing that would help any candidate a against him. Um, I think any sort of scandal on Scott Walker's part would um, would do that. And um, what's a third? A third one would be a candidate who, if all, if, if the whole thing collapses on Republicans, that the candidate appears credible. I mean, at first and foremost, the candidate the has to appear. Scott Walker. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, essentially Walker's numbers are soft right now. I mean, the Democrats let him up off the deck. We've discussed this before. Came back and, from his 38 percent approval yeah, now, rating. Yeah, but so. a, a recent poll had him at 39 percent, but, you know, Marquette has him in the 40s. So mm -hmm. Democrats, that, that, that train left a while ago. Walker got up off the deck. But they need a candidate who's actually credible, who can present him or herself to the public. Look, I can, I can take charge of this government. If they're not credible, they have absolutely no chance. And of we've winning. seen a lot of candidates locally who got carried up. I mean, they either benefited or they were uh, hurt by the tide that occurred nationally. So you don't know what's going on nationally um, with, uh, with things when Walker runs next time. If Trump is creating lots of problems and there's a big backlash against Republicans, that would be a fourth factor that could play. I mean, this it. is going to be what what the public has to be prepared for with with the backlash building against Trump. What the public has to be prepared for is a viciously negative campaign on both sides. And the reason for that is Republicans may have to try to drive down Democratic uh, turnout in terms of you know, you don't really like this candidate. So it's mm -hmm. going to be both in the governor's race and in the Senate race. Very, very negative affairs is what I would guess. So attack ads on the way. Um, this one is from John who said, I'm voting for Mayor Barrett's public safety tax in April. Will it pass? I think the first question yes, might be, well 
Well, well I get on the ballot. Of, yeah, well, the state will pay it. <laughs> right. Oh, so, Governor um, Walker has been a critic of new taxes. Um, and, and what is it? It's half of a cent? Half a cent. Um, so, mm -hmm. Sales tax increase right. that Barrett wants to use for public safety. He said it would be about $35 million a year towards uh, like police and fire and public but safety. But he has to convince the Republican uh, legislature and the governor to sign on to it, right? Right. And that's probably not very likely. And it's a pretty good wedge issue, though, for Barrett in terms of, you know, whether it passes or not. I mean, the uh, the firefighters and the police now are on the side of Republicans. So it's a pretty interesting political maneuver as well as policy maneuver to try to use that half cent sales tax. And if he has to cut, make any cuts in, in the uh, staffing for police or firefighters, he can say, look, I tried. Mm -hmm. I tried something that didn't work. I was left with no alternative. And the guy you supported the guy and you the endorsed, party you endorse, right. you know, this. did this. Yeah. Yes. So it's an interesting little wedge going on. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're done for the week, you guys. Thanks okay. so much. Thanks. Thank you.